Okay, everybody. We are super excited to be here today for our At Home with Nature, Exploring Nature. We have a great program for today, and we're going to get started in about five. We're going to see some really cool things in four. We're going to hear probably some cool things as well in two. And we have two lovely ladies here that are going to start us off. We're first going to pass it along to Raya. And Raya, you tell us all about what we're going to be talking about today. Hello, my friends. I am so excited to be chatting with you to do and with you today uh, and coming into your virtual classroom through your screen. So um, my name is Raya. Some people call me Raya Papaya, so I kind of go by both names. Um, and I am a teacher with Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Maybe you can see a little logo here. That word conservation is the most important part of our name, as far as I'm concerned, it kind of means to like save when you conserve energy, you're flipping off light switches when you're not using them, when you're conserving water, that's when you're turning the tap off when you're not using it. Um, and conserving the environment and nature is what we love to do. And we want to get everybody excited about conservation. How to get excited about conservation? Well, we want to love nature. So today is all about loving nature and exploring for different little critters in the natural world. Now today we have um, Will, who's gonna join us uh, near the end, help with some questions. So Will, if you wanna wave a little bit there. <laughs> and we um, are actually in a really special spot. So in a moment, I'll introduce who somebody can welcome us to the spot. But I wanted to mention, if you do have questions, oh, sorry about the wind, it might get loud here and there. Um, if you have questions, then your teacher can put them in the chat, if your teacher is screen sharing, and we will answer them at the end. Um, and if you happen to have a worksheet, then you can do the worksheet afterwards or during, and we'll just have fun with that. If you don't have the worksheet, that's okay too. Um, I think that a link to the worksheet will be going up in the chat in just a moment if you wanted to check that out for teachers. Now, if you are a student and you're writing in the chat, please be respectful and responsible so that we can all have a really good communication and really good chat and really good time here. So, ladies and gentlemen, where are we? Well, I'm gonna ask for Rochelle to come on screen and let us know where we are broadcasting from for you today. Hello, oh, my hair's flying everywhere. Welcome everyone. Hi, Raya, how are you today? I wanna welcome you all to the Toronto Botanical Garden. I hear you have a lovely adventure ahead of you. I'm the Director of Education here at TBG and I'm so excited to have TRCA and Raya here exploring nature and looking for some pollinators among our lovely plants. So welcome and have a wonderful visit. Thank you, Rochelle. Yes, we are at Toronto Botanical Garden. And you can see behind me, there are so many different types of flowers here. Let's enter the garden, my favorite way, and that is kind of through a little bit of a maze. So I'm going to turn my camera around and let's look up for a sec at this beautiful blue sky. And as we enter into the maze section, you can kind of see a little building in through there. That's the uh, building of Toronto, Toronto Botanical Gardens. Or garden. And here we go through Raya's favorite little entryway to the garden. Through the maze. Now, this live stream, we were thinking, you know what, this is great for grade one, three, one, two, three, and four. But if anybody else is joining as well, welcome to all of you, all the different grades that might be here. Oh, there are some super cool plants right out there in this part of the maze. Dunk. There we go, back on track. Going through, what are we gonna find today? Hmm, and maybe you know the names of some of the critters we'll be finding today and talking about. Now, as we're coming in to the big, showy, flowery space of the garden, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Look at all those flowers, such beautiful colors. And we get to explore those today. Oh, and I'm seeing some little creatures flying around. I bet you can guess who those are. Let's start by figuring out why these creatures might be flying around. Every time I try to show you one of the creatures, they kind of fly away. This one's out of focus, of course. We'll do our best with that. So I wanna have a nice close look at one of these flowers. Here's another creature who's not staying in focus. <laughs> I'll try that again. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm going to bring this flower into focus and we will have a look at why these critters are flying. So here we go. We have a beautiful little flower here. And if you notice, so oh, into focus, buddy, into focus. If you notice on this flower, there are some different parts to it. So these parts out here, you know, what do you think they're called? They're the petals, right? The petals of the flower. This flower has one, two, three, four, five petals. Excellent. Oops, I am a little bit crooked with my phone. There we go. Now, these dark spots around the middle, there's a dark spot right there. These ones, these are called anthers, and they have the pollen on them. That pollen really wants to get to this middle spot. That's called the stigma. And if the pollen can get to that middle spot, then the flower can actually make seeds. And that's what the flower wants to do. But how does the pollen get from here to there? How does it get from the outside to the inside? Well, my friends, this is where sometimes the wind can carry that pollen over. Do you think maybe two flowers can do a little kiss? Mwah! And the pollen goes from one to another. Mm, doesn't really work that way. But thankfully, bees and butterflies and other insects and some birds can help as well. So that really doesn't want to be in focus. So bees actually drink some delicious nectar from the flower and they get some of this pollen onto their bodies. And then they go visit another flower and the pollen comes off and goes into the stigma in the middle. Let's see if we can find some bees that are hanging around these plants right now and then don't fly off on us. Dun, da, da, dun. In the wind sometimes, it's a little harder to find these beautiful creatures. We'll come back to that when the wind dies down a little bit. But I wanted to ask you, have a look at this flower. So this one, it's really hard to see the pollen, the, the anther and the stigma in this flower. Actually, this whole thing is a flower head. It's like a cluster of flowers. And in the flower head, there's a bit of a shadow there. Sorry about that, team. I'm going to angle my phone differently and look at this one. In the flower head, we can see that there are actually lots and lots and lots of different flowers. And if we look at how the flower is shaped, it's kind of a cluster of flowers, right? Well, there are some insects that especially love to find a cluster of flowers to get their nectar from. And if we think about this insect right here, well, they like that landing pad. So they might fly in, land on the cluster, and then they have a nice stable perch so they can drink the nectar and get some pollen on their legs. And then they fly to another landing pad and they can drink some more nectar and some of that pollen from the first flowers might come off their legs onto the stigma of these flowers over here. So butterflies really enjoy flowers that come in clusters, in the cluster shape. And if you have the worksheet with you, you might notice that one of the questions is about the flower shapes. And you can be like, oh, I know the cluster shape. That's the butterflies right there. Oh, I wonder if I can stretch my phone out to see this bee. Bees really like any shape. And can we see the bee on this cluster flower? Look at that beautiful tiny bee. Their legs are covered in pollen. So amazing. Oh, I'm reaching the phone way, way in with my long phone stick. Very cool. So we've looked at cluster flowers. We've looked at butterflies that like to, how they like to land on the landing pad. Let's come around to another section and see if we can find some more bees. Those are actually my favorite. And as we're heading over into this part of Toronto Botanical Garden, I am noticing, whoa, whoa, my friends, bees are huge. Imagine if you were a bee nestling right in there. That looks like there's a lot, a lot of pollen on these flowers. And this one might have three different stigma, three places for the pollen to go. That's pretty cool. All right. Now, I was coming over to this area earlier, and I noticed that it was a very popular hangout spot for bees. 
So I'm just going to angle the camera down and hold it here for a moment. I want you to, know, to notice the bees flying around. Do you see bees at all? If you do, how many do you notice are flying around? Are they all the same shape? Are they all the same size? Because bees actually come in all kinds of different sizes. And if you feel like, oh, I need to move around, Raya, I've been sitting too long today, you can stand up and imagine that you are a bee buzzing around from flower to flower, drinking that delicious nectar and getting pollen all over your body <laughs> as it goes from one flower to the next. Oh, buzzing around, buzzing around. If you're in grade one or two, maybe you want to stand up and buzz around just like these bees are doing. Make your best buzzing sound. Buzz. Grade threes and fours, you can stand up too, if you like. But I know that you're able to sit a bit a little bit longer than the younger grades. Before we move on from this spot. Oh, there's Will buzzing around. He couldn't, he couldn't sit down for very long. <laughs> Thanks, Will, for showing how to do that. I love this one. When they're actually foraging, that's what it's called when they're looking for food, then they're not really interested in stinging. I want to try and coax this one to a better angle. Look how, this is a beautiful, what I think is a bumblebee, because it looks a little bit more um, plump. <laughs> you kind of maybe see it in the flowers there. All right, that was a nice little rest stop. All right, I'm going to ask for the ones and twos and whoever might have gotten up to have a seat again, and we'll carry on through the garden space. Oh, there's a butterfly there as well. Excellent. It's too far. Okay. So we were looking at the cluster shape and we were talking about different animals liking different shapes. I'm going to look at this shape over here. This is the same flower we kind of started off looking at, but it's in a different spot. And I'm looking at that. Does it look to you like kind of a more of a plate or more of a cup, that shape of flower? This one, I think it looks a bit like a cup, doesn't it? Now, if you were a butterfly, is there that landing pad that makes you attracted to this flower? Not so much. Smaller butterflies might see it as a landing pad. But depending on their size, this might not be their ideal shape. If you were, though, a beetle. <laughs> now, this one's huge. This is a toy beetle. But if it was a much smaller beetle, well, that cup shape would be just perfect for the beetle to nestle in there and take their, their time getting food, nectar, pollen from the flower. Oh, I wish I had a special zoom camera that was really able to focus because I'm still seeing a lot of tiny bees flying around these cup flowers. Those bees, they don't care what shape they're pollinating. Bees will pollinate anything. It's amazing. That's why they're so important. Okay, so we talked about the cluster the shape being great for butterflies, the cup shape being great for bees. And let's see if we can find another flower shape to talk about here. Going through the garden. Dun, 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 dun. Love this area. So green, so many different plants. Oh, I think I see it. I spotted another shape, my friends. Dun, dun, dun. Get my phone in the right position and angle it up. There we go. Have a look at this flower. Just beautiful. It kind of hangs down, right? We're seeing all these, oops, get focus, all these anthers. So lots and lots of pollen on these anthers. And in the very middle is a slightly longer piece. That's the stigma where the pollen wants to go from this flower and from others. And if we look inside, it looks like there are one, two, three, four, five tubes, five tubes down this flower. And nectar is at the back end of these tubes. They're called spurs, actually. So the nectar is in the back of the, the ends of the spurs. Now, if I was a butterfly, is there a landing pad? Not really. So some butterflies might be like, yeah, I can go there, but mostly, if there's another flower that has that cluster landing pad, that's where the, sorry, that's where the butterfly would want to go. 
I just kicked my phone stick and it jiggled. Um, beetles could maybe get in there, but they'd really have to crawl in really deep. I want you to think about other pollinators like birds. So can a bird, is there a bird with a really long beak that might act like a straw that could get deep down into those tubes, into this tubular flower? Hmm, what bird could it be? Da, 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 da. If you said A, is the picture coming up? Let's see, hummingbird, yes! Hummingbirds have these amazing beaks that act like straws that can reach really down into tubular flowers. And um, the flower in the picture that was shown, that's a, called a cardinal flower, really lovely flower. Um, hummingbirds also like the columbine, which I'm showing now, because they can reach right in there to get the nectar. Oh, I just found another columbine with an even longer set of spurs. Look how long these tubes are. So long. Very cool. And of course, bees love these too. <laughs> I've seen bees go into the columbine as well. Super exciting. If you are feeling like you're getting antsy again and you're saying, Raya, I need to move, you can stand up. Imagine you are a bird flying around and you have a long beak and you're reaching it into one of these tubular flowers and you're sucking the nectar up. And then you can fly back to your seat and see what we can discover next. Okay, one of my favorite things to explore are trees love flowers and trees also produce flowers and then if i go down to the bottom of trees where it's shady sometimes i can discover things i didn't see before let's see what we have at the bottom of this tree oh my goodness somebody's been here somebody has somebody been here with a hole puncher that's what it looks like <laughs> but i'll tell you this is actually not from a student with a hole puncher trying to make some natural confetti. This is instead from a bee. We've been talking about how bees like to pollinate. Well, bees have a really cool, some bees have a really cool um, part of their life cycle that involves making holes from leaves. So when you think about bees, where do you think they live? What do you call their home? You can put it in your, in your classroom chat, if you want to put it in this chat, you can put it in this chat, just that one word. What would you call their home? Now, if you said hive, then you are correct. That's what a lot of that's where a lot of bees live. However, there are a lot of bees that don't live in hives. There are some bees that need little tunnels to live in and lay their eggs in. And maybe well, Will is gonna pull up the picture here. Excellent. You can see that this bee has found a tunnel in a stump. And they have brought in some leaves, some little hole punchy leaves. You can keep that picture up, Will. That's okay. So they've brought in some circles of leaves and they have lined the tunnel with the leaves. And then they put pollen in the tunnel and they've laid an egg on the pollen ball. And the larva each gets their own little room. The larva grow up in that tunnel. And these bees don't live in a hive. They don't have a colony. They don't have a queen to protect. So they don't really sting. They're not aggressive. And they're called solitary bees because they kind of live a solitary, like a alone kind of life. And Will's going to show us a video that shows a bee hacking the tunnel with pollen. Isn't that cool? You can see the leaves that have been chewed up and they're lining the sides. And the bee using their back legs hacking the tunnel with pollen. And now it looks like the, leaf, the bee is going out to either get more leaves or more pollen. Hi, bee. So if you ever see holes like this when you're exploring nature, they're like pretty perfect circles in a leaf, then a bee is the one who did that, which I think is just amazing. And there are so many in this area here. So many leaf cutter bees have been around laying eggs somewhere because they're getting their nesting material from this little patch. Oh my gosh. What? That's so cool. The wild strawberry, my friends. Who here likes strawberries? I love how wildlife and human life often enjoy the same types of foods. Very cool. All right, let's keep looking. We are going to go down a trail right behind me. And if you're thinking of good questions, 
Make sure your teachers, if they're able to access the, yeah, the chat on YouTube, they can put it in the chat. We'll have a look at a few more things here. Oh my gosh, these plants are covered! <laughs> covered in little teeny tiny insects called aphids. And boys and girls, if you haven't seen them before, aphids, they like to drink the sap of the plant and then they poop out this shiny. Let's see if we can see the shininess on the leaf. They poop out this shiny stuff. It's kind of like poop. Um, and it's so sweet that we call it honeydew. And because it's so sweet, there are other insects who like to eat that honeydew. Oh, buddy, you went on my hand. I didn't mean for that to happen. Now he's crawling on my arm and he flew away. But there are other insects who like to actually drink that honeydew that the aphids kind of poop out. That's wild. What else can we find? <gasps> Ladies and gentlemen, this is so cool. You're like, Raya, that's spit. Somebody spit on the plant. No, it's cooler than that. <laughs> this is actually, get it into focus. It looks exactly like spit, but it's from a spittle bug. Oops, did I get some on my finger? I think I did. So there is an insect inside and they will produce that spittle because it keeps them from drying out and it protects them from predators. So if you see what looks like spit on a plant, it is probably from the spittle bug, also known as a leaf popper. Oh, I love finding all these little itty bitty bits out here in the natural world. Exploring nature is so much fun. I love seeing berries. Earlier there was a cat bird here. Oh, and they like to eat, I think they like to eat these berries because otherwise I don't know why that cat bird would have been hanging out here. Cat birds have a sound like a cat. Meow. A couple of robins in that tree that have been moving around. They look like young robins. They still have their spots like young robins do. Wow, there's so much to explore here. I just love it. Now, oh, this is perfect. I have a little quiz for you. We talked about the different plant shapes and I'm gonna come right up here to a plant and I want you to let your teacher know or put in the chat, who do you think likes to pollinate? If I can get the wind to stop blowing it, who likes to pollinate this type of plant? Maybe you saw the bee coming out of that one. So this plant has a tubular flower shape. Who would be attracted to this plant? And by the way, this plant is called beard Tongue. Can you imagine? What a name. Beard tongue. There is a bee in there going from flower to flower. So we know bee is one answer, but there's another answer too. If you said hummingbird, yes, hummingbirds love these tubular flowers. That's tubular, man. All right. Let's go across this little patch of grass. We're going to play a game. And because I love games. And I'm gonna tell you how the game works. The game is actually a game that you can play when you go out with your family or with your friends. And the way it works is that um, if I was out doing this in person, then I'm gonna get the I'm gonna come to the other side of the phone here. So if I was doing this in person, then I want to make sure it was somebody that was kind of in my COVID bubble to be safe. Um, and I would think about a, something really small or specific that I want to show that person. And then I would get them to cover their eyes and I would carefully guide them to a certain spot and then have them open their eyes like a camera for just a moment. And so they're looking at that very detailed thing. So we're gonna play human camera where I'm actually just gonna cover the screen with my hand as we go and look at beautiful specific things. So we're gonna close our eyes. If you want to close your eyes to play along, you can. And I'm gonna do a three, two, one when we're opening our eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, three, two, one. Dun, 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 dun. What are we looking at? <laughs> this is actually a flower. I can't see if it's in focus, one sec. Angle it differently so I can see the screen. So this is a flower on a tree that looks an awful lot like a tulip. And having trouble with my focus today, there we go. And so this tree is actually called a tulip tree. It doesn't always flower, but isn't that a beautiful flower when it does? And then the leaves of the tulip tree have a really funny shape to them. They kind of, they have like these four points. And I heard somebody describe the leaves that they look like kind of duck feet. So 
I'm just going to do a little comparison here. Do you look like duck feet? My duck foot in my pocket. A little bit. I guess what it means is that the leaf points, they look like they're kind of webbed like duck feet. So this tree that has duck feet looking leaves and sometimes have flowers that look like tulips is called a tulip tree. Beautiful tree. And birds and some little mammals like to eat the seeds of the tulip tree. And bees, there's one trying to combat the wind to get inside here. Where'd he go? <laughs> oh, there we go. There's a bee going inside this tulip. See if we can see him in there. You see that bee moving around? Hello, little bee. Are you getting some good nectar? So cool. All right, one more human camera. Dun, da, da, da. What is Raya going to show us next? She's guiding us and we're getting close. Boys and girls in three, two, one. Open your eyes. <laughs> this one is a cool little tiny flower. Kind of looks like, kind of like a cup shape. I bet beetles would like to pollinate that. And the plant is actually, if I can get it in focus. Come on, plant. Doesn't like my hand going in front of it so much. I'm going to turn my screen off and on again to get the um, screen in focus again. If it'll work. Don't you love it when this happens on a live stream? I think it'll catch up eventually. But this one is called Canada anemone. And um, it's a lovely plant to have around. Okay, let's play human camera. Maybe the phone will figure itself out. And we'll go to one last human camera. Boys and girls, join me in looking at this in three, two, one. Oh, what are we looking at? Not a flower this time. These are leaves. They're like needle leaves. So this is a coniferous plant, a conifer. And my focusing issue hasn't seemed to have changed. Give me one sec, everybody. Raya, do you want to try turning off your camera and just turning it back on with the button? And then, uh, Rochelle, are you okay? Maybe you can see, show us the bird nest that maybe you are uh, been typing in chat here? Sure. Can you hear me okay? I can show you the bird. I need to figure out how to flip my camera. <laughs> it's a bit that tricky. I'll be I can honest try and you. turn it. Tell me if you see it. I'm pointing to yeah. it. It'll be a bit it's hard a, to see. It's a bit hard to see. But point if you can. Okay, I'm pointing. Should be about right at the tip of my finger. There's mm -hmm. a baby bird. And when oh. I started texting you, the mama was feeding it the berries from this tree. Oh, and do you know what kind of bird it was up there? It is a robin. Ah, a robin. It, can you see it at all or no? <laughs> no, we can see the tree, um, but not the She's bird. Very... They are quite far. Let me try and get around. She's very well camouflaged there. She's out of the light. You can see her bum or his bum. No? Um, I'll be honest, I can't see it as of right now. It's a bit hard it, it, with all Sorry. the lighting, but uh, hey, yeah. we believe you. We believe you there. <laughs> and uh, is it, it, I've never seen it before. I've never seen a mama feed, their ber feed berries to their babies before. Yeah, and do you think there was just one of the baby robins there? Nope. Actually, I can try and see if I can show you the other one in the other tree. Yeah. And one really cool thing about follow robins, too. Oh, here we go. We'll follow. Trying to get the camera higher. Do you see her? Oh, hold on. Hold. Steady. Oh. Oh. We see the berries. A beautiful image of probably what they're feeding. Okay. And higher? Are they... Are they in the Y of the tree here? They are if you've, oh, if you've, oh, she just flew away. <laughs> oh, all good. Sorry about that. It was very cool to see though. All good, all good. No, uh, we, we bet. Oh, Raya, you good there? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Rochelle. We're going to pass back to Raya here right now. Hi, everybody. <laughs> That's the thing about wildlife is that sometimes it's here one second and it's gone the next. You know, we're trying to show you bees and birds and they just want to, fly away and move around, especially in this beautiful day. So one last activity before we get to our questions, my friends. And this one has to do with 
looking for critters in a way we haven't looked before under logs. And we're so lucky that right now at Toronto Botanical Garden, it looks like there's a project going on here and we have a lot of logs we can check out. Um, underneath logs is a great spot to find critters because they are down there decomposing the log itself, living in the soil. And when we're log flipping, ah, I think this is a good one. And with the shade, I don't have to worry about the shadows. So when we are log flipping, we want to do it really respectfully. So we always put the log back where it was after we've had our look. So let's see who might be under this log. Whoa, there is a beautiful beetle under this log. There is a very cool, if I can move it over, a very cool worm, earthworm, under this log that's been decomposing the soil. And if we look on the log itself, we can see that these creatures have been doing a wonderful job. There's some fungus as well, helping to decompose the log and take the log's energy and turn it back into soil. So when you're exploring nature, then I encourage you to carefully and respectfully see if you can flip some logs. Maybe we'll try one more over here just because I can't resist. I'm really hoping to see like a centipede or something. Oh, I haven't flipped this one before. Let's see. Ugh. Oh, there's another earthworm over this way. And there are little tiny plants that are like, we want to try growing even though there's no sun. That's why they're white, because there isn't much sun. <gasps> Ladies and gentlemen, we found a pill bug. Maybe you've seen these guys before. I used to call them potato bugs. They have a bunch of different names. And these creatures, these pill bugs, they're super cool. They actually, I just learned this, they carry their eggs in a pouch, kind of. Maybe like a kangaroo, I don't know. Except kangaroos don't lay eggs. Um, so these guys have eggs in the pouch. When the eggs hatch, then the babies actually will stay in that pouch for a couple of days even. And when they get nervous, I don't want to make this guy nervous, but when they get nervous, they'll curl up into a little tiny ball. There is a little teeny tiny pill bug nestled in. Where'd he go? Oh, you can barely see him because he's so nestled in. But I like to do that too if I need need a break I might curl up into a little ball just to be cozy with myself check this one out doesn't look quite like an earthworm looks like a different kind of a a creature oh I love looking at these little critters so pollinators and also other critters who might live under oh help me push it back bugs excellent Whew. that was a lot of exploring my friends I'm going to Turn the screen around and we'll take questions in a moment, but I did just want to really quickly show you that if you do come to Toronto Botanical Garden, there is actually a pathway that takes you down into a ravine and Toronto's ravines are beautiful and it's a whole other space to explore. There's a river down there and I highly, highly recommend it. Now, my friends, we've been chatting for a little while here. If you feel like Whew. I'm exhausted. I've been exploring with Raya. I might need to go. That's okay. We're, we're going to take some questions, but if you do need to go, it has been wonderful to have you with us today. And um, I encourage you to explore and get out there, roll, unroll some logs and put them back, but see who's under there. I actually didn't pull it out today too much, but I do have a magnifying glass with me because sometimes I like that to help explore. Um, so if you do need to go, it's been great having you. If you can stay, I'd love to hear if there are any questions that have turned up in the chat. Will? Yeah, definitely, Ryan. There have been a couple questions come through in the chat. And by all means, once we're answering these questions, uh, if there's more in the chat, we'll hopefully address as many as we can within the lot of time that we have. But to start us off, Raya, we have a great question here. And I'm going to pull it up on the screen for us. Is the foam from the spittle bug safe to touch? That's a good question. I haven't exactly researched it. Um, I've known about spittle bugs for a long time and I've never heard about it being unsafe. So I think that it's safe to touch. Like, I don't think I'm gonna have an issue, but you know what, to be honest, before you, in this case, don't take my word for it, <laughs> before you go touching that foam to see how it feels, um, maybe do a little research of your own. See, is spittle bug foam safe to touch? Um, mm -hmm. I think so, I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. 
Yeah, and it also acts like a little bit of a home for that insect too, right? So yeah, we don't want to like know. press it or anything. We don't want to. Yeah, exactly. It. You know, we can do some, you know, observational exploring, and maybe if it is like a little after some research, we can look into it. But we're not crushing it, right? Because that's where our insect is living. Yeah, great question we have there. We have another question here, and uh, what are the bumps on the tree leaves? Ooh, did you see some bumps on tree leaves? I might not I even notice. They did. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh my gosh, this is this would be a whole other live stream. So, there are a lot of insects that interact with plants that have a relationship with plants that is so cool, where the insect actually lives like inside the plant, and in a lot of cases, it doesn't harm the plant at all. Those bumps are called galls, and some plants have galls that are like on the stem that you'll see a big bump right on the stem. Um, and other times the galls might be almost make the plant look like it has this extra flower on it because it's like a bunchy gall. Um, but the bumps on leaves, if I'm thinking of the same ones that uh, you're asking about, those are a type of gall. So an insect kind of created those and it helps protect the insect inside. Ah, really good question. Uh, I actually didn't know about that un until now. I always thought it was like really bad for the trees and all that, but... Uh, yeah, there might be some that aren't great for the trees, um, but I know that because there are like hundreds and hundreds of different types of galls, there are a lot of galls that are not an issue. I don't know specifically if the ones on trees are a problem for the trees. Mm -hmm. And if anybody else, um, like if anybody on our team, if Rochelle or if Jasmine, if anybody knows about that specifically, by all means, jump in. Uh, yeah, by all means. Uh, we have another question here, and it is, how many different types of trees are there? Oh, goodness, yeah, how many different types of trees are there? I love it. Um, let's see. Well, I mean, the short answer is lots. I think in Canada, there are several hundred tree species. Um, in Ontario, we might have several hundred, but they aren't all necessarily native species. We didn't talk about native and invasive and non-native today. Some trees that have been existing in Ontario for a very long time, I mean, that might only be like, I'm just making up a number a little bit, but might be more like 100. Um, and then a lot of other trees that have come in to this part of the world that didn't used to live here and um, some of them even kind of take over the space. So that would add the number of trees that are in this area. But I believe in Canada, it's a few hundred, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and uh, we did some little background research as well with the team here. And it's about 85 different species of trees that are native in Ontario. Now, that's Ontario. So really, like, right on, uh, right on the mark there, Raya, for Ontario. And I could definitely see it being, you know, a couple hundred within Canada as well. So uh, awesome. So we have another question here. Great question. Thank you for that one there. Is, is it common to find salamanders in Toronto? Ooh, good question. There, I believe there are some salamanders in Toronto, and I'm saying that because in the biodiversity booklet series, um, I can picture a cover of, it's all about Toronto uh, creatures, and it, I think the cover has a salamander on it. I usually find salamanders more when I'm out of the city myself. Um, but I, I believe that there might be a few places in Toronto where salamanders might exist. To be honest, I haven't found any myself. And um, they really, they're really sensitive creatures and sensitive, sensitive to pollution. Like they kind of, like frogs, they might breathe through their skin, right? So um, partially. And so uh, with more pollution in Toronto, we might have fewer organisms that are that Mm -hmm. And I know within one of our conservation or um, areas that we've worked with, with one of the programs that we have in the area of Toronto, uh, I think it's West End of Toronto and like the east side of Mississauga is the Jefferson Salamander. And there's even some areas that we uh, that we, the TRCA, along with other municipalities, well, we're not a municipality itself, we're conservation authority, but we work with municipalities uh, protecting the areas where these Jefferson salamanders live. Uh, many salamanders, and we can say even amphibians that live here in Ontario that are native, are species at risk due to the you know severity that humans have on the impact of the land that they live in, climate change, and many other things too. But Jefferson salamander is just one of the, uh, the salamanders that live in our area. So yeah, that's a really good question there. Ryan, did you have something to add there? Or no, I had a bee in my ear. 
Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> I heard this loud buzzing. <laughs> I'm like, I can't hear Willoughby. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have another great question here. Is how can you tell if a caterpillar or a bee uh, bit a leaf? And I think uh, I can also attest to this. Maybe people are thinking, uh, you know, the gypsy moths, right? Maybe is it a gypsy moth or is it a bee eating the leaf of the tree that I have? I'm looking around for an example of a leaf with a hole in it. And oh, I found a maple leaf that has a bit of a hole in it. Now, this hole is not that perfect circle. And that makes me think it's probably some kind of caterpillar that um, chewed into this one. The bees that use leaves for their tunnels when they're laying their eggs, um, those leaf cutter bees, they actually, oh, that wind is probably quite loud for you guys. They actually have um, really strong mandibles of like their jaw area to bite into those leaves. And they do tend to make those perfect circles. I don't think that in Ontario, we have other bees that will chew a hole that isn't a circle that would be like this one. Um, I'm pretty sure that other insects, whether they're caterpillars or some other kind of insect would make um, the holes that are like weird shapes. So perfect circle is probably the leaf cutter bee. Not perfect circle is probably another different type of insect. Hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, it's pretty easy to see or start to notice these differences as well. Uh, a caterpillar such as a monarch butterfly only eats milkweed. So you also can kind of tell sometimes maybe is it a caterpillar or maybe is it a bee just on the type of plant that you're looking at. And caterpillars, uh, especially the monarch I can I can speak to, is it kind of eats in a, in a crescent moon shape when it's really young. So it kind of leaves almost like a crescent moon in the middle of a leaf. And then as it gets older, it will really just devour the entire leaf, except for maybe a little part of the vein of the leaf itself. Whereas our leaf cutter bees, right? You know, as Raya showed earlier, it's really, you know, they're just taking out almost the same thing of a crescent moon out of the leaf. And it's very clean cut, right? Very efficient in what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. So we have another question here as they are coming through. And this one is kind of a, kind of a fun one is how many different types of plants I presume is, uh, did we show today, right? Or how many do you think we showed or saw? Oh, like the ones that I specifically talked about or like held my hand on, maybe that was doo -doo -doo, about 15 perhaps, but we passed by, I mean, Toronto Botanical Garden has so many different types of plants here, like so many different types of flowers to really show these differences. We probably passed by a good hundred. I'd say like when you take it all into account, you know, um, including trees and shrubs and flowers and just everything. Um, but yeah, I think I probably handled about maybe 10 to 15. 10 to 15. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And there's uh, and I, I believe that in a botanical garden as well, there are hundreds of different species that are there and it's a beautiful place. We were uh, getting a bit of a background tour of it uh, when we were setting up for it. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a magical place. Uh, and I hope to get out there maybe later, later this year myself. Now, I think uh, this is another kind of fun one, a bit, uh, a bit interesting as well. And we've talked a bit about worms in other live streams of our soils once. If you're a grade three teacher, by all means, check that out on our YouTube page. It's a great one. Raya goes into depth about soils. And she talks a bit about her worms. But this question is directly around worms. How does a worm regenerate or even if it's split in two? So I guess the idea is if a worm's cut in half, how is it still alive? Yeah, so we hear about like if a worm's cut in half, does it become two worms? So that is not true. They do not become two worms. You now have a worm that is cut in half and it's probably wriggling because their, their nervous system is like through their whole body, but it's not going to survive. It's not going to become two healthy worms. Um, so in order to regenerate, um, you need two worms to get together. And then when that has happened, then they actually lay eggs. Yeah, I didn't used to know that, that worms, oh, it's so windy here. I hope the noise isn't too loud, that, the, that worms actually lay eggs in the soil. And, um, and that's how they reproduce. And then you get these little tiny baby worms that can grow bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Thank you, Raya, for that. Um, we have, I believe we have one more question that we have here. And I'll just pull it up on the screen right now for us. I'll take away that one. This one's uh, 
pretty interesting, similar to our trees one, but more specifically flowers. How many native flowers are there in Ontario? Um, and we did Ooh. some background research of it too, uh, as well. You have an answer, Will? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do um, for it. I know a big thing and a big messaging that we have all throughout the TRCA and, and in a lot of our programs that we have here is making sure that you know our gardens at our homes and what we're planting are native plants because the species that we're inter interacting with and even Ryan is interacting with, those native species are used to while well, those insects are used to native plants, plants that have been around for many years that they have grown up with, really. Uh, and there's about 4,000 native plants in Ontario. Wow. Is, I have I this book with me in my backpack, and it's all about the pollinators of native plants. And um, I just love this book. And I was looking up earlier for the Canada anemone. We can see that there are some beetles that pollinate. That was the second human camera plant that we did. There are some beetles that pollinate that plant as well as other creatures as well. So 4,000, Will? That is so many native plants in Ontario. That's amazing. Oh, more than 3,999, that's for sure. Yep, so, more than that. <laughs> uh, I don't see any more questions coming in right now. Uh, Raya, Rochelle, is there anything uh, you'd like to say to maybe close us out? I can uh, pull up the two of you if you would like. Sure. Rochelle, if you want to wave a little goodbye to everybody, then I'll do a final send-off. Sure. I, just, thanks for joining us today. And uh, Raya, Will, glad you were here. Um, the excursion was amazing. I had a fun walk through the, through the garden again today and saw some things from a new light. So I appreciate that. And we hope you'll come back and visit. And um, everybody out there, the garden is open every day from sunrise to sunset. So come on by and, and take a tour. Of, have a nice visit. And Say hi to the staff when you're here. Amazing. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, and I want to say also, I'm going to reiterate what I said a few minutes ago. Please, my friends, if you are able to do so safely during this pandemic time, get outside, explore the natural world, look under things, get really close, look in things, um, and check out if you can find butterflies or bees or beetles, or maybe you'll find hummingbirds, or maybe you'll find worms all these amazing creatures that help the world be a healthy place and that are just super, super fun to learn about. So get outside, enjoy the rest of your school year, enjoy the summer. And we have one more live stream in the summer. So it's not during school. Um, it's actually a special one that we hope grownups will tune in for. And it's about fish and about how we want to check out the fish in Lake Ontario and find out if they are healthy um, as well. So if you keep your eyes on the trca.ca events page, then you'll see that event coming up towards the end of July, learning about how we do our fish monitoring. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye, everybody. <laughs>